Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, the lecture will begin soon. As a safety precaution and in case of emergency, please follow the direction of the exit sign to evacuate orderly. Before the start of today's lecture, I would like to make a few housekeeping announcements. First, please switch off your mobile phones or change them into silence mode during the lecture. Second, our staff should have given everyone a copy of attendance certificate. Please fill in your name and let our staff to step on it after the lecture at the reception counter. Before the start of today's lecture, let us take a group photo first. So everybody, please look at the stage and look at our photographer. <laughs> look at the camera. Everybody ready? Ready? OK, three, two, one, smile. One more. Three, two, one, cheers. OK. Thank you, everybody, and what a great start of today's lecture organized by the Hong Kong Institution of Engineers. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Cindy, today's MC and also the member of the HKIE President Protégé Scheme. The two lectures are organized this year. The first lecture, presented by Mr. Shan Chi Ming, was successfully held on last Saturday, and today, we have the great pleasure to invite Professor Norbert Morgenstern to be our guest speaker. Now, may I invite our President Engineer Thomas Chen to give us a welcome speech. Engineer Chen, please. Professor Morgenstern, distinguished guests, fellow members, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. On behalf of the institution, it's my pleasure to welcome you all to the second lecture of our distinguished lecture series. The theme of the lecture this year is a climate change and engineering solutions. The first lecture took place three days ago with Mr. Sun Chi Ming as our speaker, who shared his insight into global climate change and its implication to Hong Kong. If you have missed the lecture, don't worry. Video recordings will be available online later. Today, we are honored to have Professor Robert Morgenstern with us as the speaker. Professor Morgan Stern is a distinguished university professor emeritus at the University of Alberta. He is an international authority on geotechnical engineering relating to slope stability and dams design, a pioneer of permafrost and co regions engineering research, and a highly sought after consultant. He has experience with major projects in over 30 countries on six continents and has received numerous prestigious awards. Professor Morgan Stern is, will deliver a presentation entitled The Elevation of Slope Stability, a Further 25 Year Perspective. He will share with us his personal learning with relevant case histories under subheadings of analysis and design, mobility and risk, and professional practice later in his presentation. Hong Kong is a hilly city with a substantial portion of urban development located near hillsides. Under the influence of climate change, extreme rainfall events will become more frequent and intense. There is an increasing impact of extreme weather that could cause natural hazard with multiple fatalities and economic losses in our city. I am sure Professor Morgan Stern's invaluable sharing of his experience and knowledge will bring much benefit 
to the relevant engineering disciplines as does to Hong Kong as a whole. Finally, I would like to express my appreciation to our speaker, Professor Robert Morgenstern, the organizing committee chairman, Mr. Professor, uh, Engineer Professor Lei Chui Fun, other members of organizing committee, our sponsors, and all the participants who make the lectures possible. Thank you very much. Thank you, Engineer Chen, and please stay. Now, we will move to the souvenir presentation ceremony. May I invite Professor Morgenstern, our honorable guest speaker today, to come on stage and receive the souvenir. Professor Morgenstern, please. Thank you, Engineer Chen and Professor Morgenstern. Please stay. May I now invite all the members of the organizing committee for the distinguished lecture, the HKIE officer, past presidents, and our chief executive and secretary, as well as all the representatives from our sponsors, including Arab, Chen World Development Holdings Limited, Philgo Hong Kong Group, Henderson Land Group, Hopewell Holdings Limited, to come on stage and take a group photo. Thank you, everyone. And oh, we have one more for the mobile phone. Uh, thank you, everyone, and please be seated. May I now invite our speaker, Professor Morgenstern, to deliver his presentation on the evaluation of slope stability, a further 25-year perspective. Professor Morgenstern, please. Thank you very much, and thank you for that generous introduction. It's an honor to be here to renew acquaintances and make new friends, and as well see many old students, in fact, who are happily engaged here in Hong Kong. Uh, the title is somewhat enigmatic, and let me explain uh, what I uh, had hoped to do in this lecture. Um, about 25 years ago, I, I'm no longer an active researcher, so I really can't give you the latest word from the research laboratories that I tend to be involved in, so I thought that I would focus a little bit on the practice and some of the learnings from practice over the last couple of decades on key projects. And about 25 years ago, I did a state-of-the-art presentation for an ASCE meeting uh, dealing with a 25-year perspective, and I thought that might be a place to start in certain in these three categories of analysis and design, mobility and risk, and professional practice, with an emphasis on slopes and dams, um, which are my major uh, professional activity. So I begin with a quotation from this paper 25 years ago. One can imagine a time when simulation is so firmly embedded within the observational method that it becomes recognized as an essential tool in assisting the practicing engineer to evaluate correctly all of the information available to him. This places a greater burden on the engineer to recognize and understand in an ongoing manner the limitations of advanced analysis. And we will see in the next few minutes how that projection to the future is playing out uh, in our time at this moment. At the same time, around that same time, in another keynote address, I made the observation that the most important development in limit equilibrium analysis, which is a, a backbone of stability, 
uh, in recent years have related to three-dimensional methods of analysis. That's going to be a sub-theme in the following case history. Uh, the case history that we're going to start with is a dam that exists in the province of Saskatchewan. Um, and uh, it is a flood storage scheme uh, designed to capture um, water in the watershed north of the dam and collect it from flowing down into North Dakota where there's a threat to the city of, of Fargo and so forth. Uh, it's not a huge dam, but a dam that had a certain checkered history. Uh, and, but what triggered the current, current reviews that we're going to look at was large runoff in the year of 2011. The dam had been completed some years before surcharge the dam some five to six meters above full supply level to basically the maximum flood level it was designed to take, and increased rates of shear displacement in the clay shale foundation that exists beneath it. So one doesn't like to see a dam moving under those conditions. Uh, there were recommendations by the uh, consultant brought in to assess conditions after they did a calculation that the factor of safety was unity and hence close to failure to lower the reservoir, investigate further, and conduct detailed assessments as soon as possible. Uh, this illustrates the dam. It's a, fairly, it's a homogeneous dam with an internal filter. Uh, nothing peculiar in a sense about the dam itself. You see to the right of the picture a very substantial um, uh, substantial berm, which is a result of the movements, which we'll talk about, that developed during construction. Uh, the dam is uh, some one and a quarter kilometers long and only 42 meters high, nothing dramatic in terms of a cross-section, but somewhat dramatic in terms of its foundation. Uh, the dam was highly instrumented uh, because of its history during construction. You see lots of pitsometers within the dam and you see the locations of inclinometers uh, in the dam. I not sure I'm getting oh, inclinometers here and here, which we'll refer to presently. So we're dealing with a, a structure that has a lot of instrumentation to help us diagnose what might be going on. Uh, the uh, sorry. Oh, wrong one. <laughs> The historical performance of the dam is in this reference that will be in the final version of, of this presentation that I think you'll get on the video. Uh, it, it, it developed very large movements in the foundation during construction, up to half a meter, developed very high pore pressures. The foundation involves glacial till, fairly dense soil-like deposit, overlying what we call a clay shale, which is a very stiff clay to a soft rock. Uh, what had happened, notwithstanding a fairly uh, prestigious review board, is the critical conditions when you encounter glacial deposits over these argillaceous soft bedrocks is to anticipate this what we call glacial drag. And they didn't recognize the fact that the material at that interface was at residual strength with friction values in the order of 10 degrees. So it was moving and close to failure when I was asked to uh, come in and, 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 and assist in remediation. So that was, uh, we had to stop construction for a while, design substantial berms, repair some, some decants in the, in the facility, and ultimately it was filled in 1999 and performed successfully afterwards. Uh, here you see, if you can read, uh, some records of high excess pore pressures during construction very slow dissipation of post-construction, of, of, of poor pressure since construction. They remain high today. And as the reservoir moves up and down, setting aside the flood condition, because it, it fills up and down every spring, little bits of movement are occurring in the foundation, notwithstanding, we thought, fairly good factor safety. So that's the background of the facility that then did a lurch under this full supply, and the analysis uh, indicated a factor of safety of unity, which we'll turn to in a moment. You can see here uh, the, uh, the inclinometer data, which is indicating a very discrete shear plane at the interface of this till deposit on the clay shale, and you can see the uh, substantial hundreds of millimeters of movement that occurred during construction with lesser amounts elsewhere. So these are a couple of the inclinometers that I drew attention to. Well, they're in the, in the cross-section that you see up above. So we understand the mechanism. 
Uh, we understand that it moved under this, uh, this, this uh, flood level to, uh, uh, to some degree, and we understand that an analysis has been, in, underta been undertaken that indicates it's on the brink of failure. Now, the analysis was actually an analysis that looked at instability in a cross-section from the dam into the spillway excavation. So it's kind of undercut within the foundation. And that was the analysis, two-dimensional analysis, that indicated a factor of safety of unity. Having been involved in these kinds of conditions uh, uh, fairly often, it was clear that that two-dimensional analysis was a, a, an exaggeration of the risk and a three-dimensional analysis because the slip surface would have to go through this relatively thick till and break out uh, uh, along the, the shear plane at the, at the, that we saw before and then come out through the till. So we undertook three-dimensional limit analysis, um, which is part, just part of the story. And you can see that instead of having a factor of safety of unity, the three-dimensional analyses um, indicated factors of safety of, of two. And we need to worry about the locations of the surface, but they were basically, uh, basically cutting. Sorry, I've got to go back. Uh, I'm going the wrong way. They were, they were uh, three-dimensional surfaces breaking through in, in that direction, oblique to the oblique to the, uh, the spillway excavation, and other analyses in the normal normal uh, direction, all indicated a substantial factor of safety. So that uh, put a put a uh, an end to the immediate concern. Uh, it illustrated part of the prognosis some 10 years or 15 years early that three-dimensional limit analysis uh, has its role in practice today. And here you see an application of it. And we're using it um, consistently, not necessarily at an early design stage, but once the actual mechanics of movements are developing, one feels more comfortable drawing on that extra resistance. But the owner wanted more information. Uh, he wanted uh, to. Uh, he wanted some understanding that if these movements are going to continue, are they going to be significant? They're still moving with reservoir fluctuations up and down. So he wanted a prognosis of whether we're going to run into trouble in the future with the movements, notwithstanding a healthy factor of safety. So given the configuration of the dam, uh, the only way that we felt we could sensibly respond to that was to undertake a three-dimensional deformation analysis. And uh, that was conducted with the uh, computer program known to many of you called FLAC. And we history matched the pore pressures, which were well established. And we used reasonable properties with some adjustment to history match the deformations that had been monitored. So we're building what I like to call a model equivalence of the, of the, of the behavior, the performance up to that time. And you can see here some, uh, some equivalence of what we're calculating with, with the observation. You can see that we didn't get the deformation pattern in plan quite right. The vectors that we calculated in 3D are a little different from the vectors that, uh, that were observed. All the pore pressures were used by an interpolation technique as inputs, so we didn't have to predict pore pressures. They were well monitored. They were part of that. So we then began to uh, take this to failure. And uh, in this kind of analysis, the uh, traditional way to take it to failure is, sorry, uh, is to uh, is to reduce the strength until you get the, the mechanism to, to collapse. That's mimicking the definition of the factor of safety of limit equilibrium. It's defined as that factor whereby you reduce the strength parameters to bring it to a state of equilibrium. Though this kind of strength reduction process can be applied in the deformation model to bring it to failure. And there's lots of experience saying you get more or less the same answer with the limit analysis. So that is what we began to do. And uh, so we see that we undertook the conventional you know, strength reduction, uh, reducing all the material properties until failure, and uh, hence uh, getting from the deformation analysis the equivalence of something close to the factor of safety we would have got from the limit analysis, which we had with the 3D. However, that asked, began to raise the question, 
given that the definition of factor of safety is actually a kind of stress path, is that the actual stress path to failure? Because one has to follow the stresses to failure to get the deformations to failure. And we're looking for these deformations. Or are there other ways it would be failing? This structure had come to its full resistance along this till clay shale interface. It was already at residual strength. You could not physically reduce that strength any further. So the concept of trying to reduce that strength to match the, con the consistency of the limit equilibrium analysis, uh, analysis definition is illogical. The concept of the le that definition implying a stress path for these circumstances is not logical. There are other ways it would fail, and the most likely way it would fail is that already weakened strength would stay there, and the breakout zone, the till zone that's holding everything in place, would deteriorate or, or weaken, and that would be the failure mode. So the um, lesson then was to look at that, which we can of reduce the till strength only until that goes to failure. And as you might anticipate, as we see in the next slide, you get different answers. Here are the answers on the left, the deformation. The numbers perhaps aren't meaningful. It's, it's the logic that's meaningful. Here are the deformations on the left that we would calculate to failure. And on the right are the deformations um, uh, that we would calculate to failure by just reducing the strength in the till alone. Fairly straightforward activity with, these, with the flag program. First of all, we note that they're very different. So the traditional factor of safety with stress reduction would give you a false sense of security by the large amount of deformation that it forecasts. But more importantly is the, is the recognition that as we move to deformation modeling, the concept of the stress path implied by the definition of the factor of safety is illogical. And I see as we're moving increasingly into real-time deformation, history-matching modeling and forecasting, I see the end of the factor of safety as a basis of design. And we'll be relying, I think, more and more on history-matched uh, numerical simulation and then challenging within that history match how might it fail? In this case, it could fail um, through the till. It might fail because of high pore pressure zone. And you could then challenge all of the potential failure modes uh, going forward. So one of the learnings that I wanted to pass on to you is, firstly, this kind of inconsistency, illogicality with a cornerstone of our, of our craft and, and how it's in the process of being superseded by the more efficient numerical modeling that, that, uh, that we're talking about. This raises several questions. Um, not so much the difficulty of doing the modeling. The modeling is increasingly cost effective and time effective and all of that. Um, but it does raise questions from a regulatory point of view and guidelines and, and all the codes and so on that we have to respect as well. We're, so what I see looking to the future for this class of problems is we have been up to now in what we might call a precautionary based design. We do our design based on a factor of safety. We recognize we have monitoring and observational method and we look for potential changes from the design base and we maintain the factor of safety going forward. Moving more now towards a performance based design in which we calculate, instead of a factor of safety, local reserve resistances, and I haven't come up with a catchy phrase. I'm sure that as we work with this more systematically, we'll end up with the right, uh, uh, the right, the right terminology, but local reserve resistances for different failure modes. Of course, monitoring. Of course, observational method, but always being integrated with real-time response modeling as going forward. So the, the, the postulation of 25 years ago, we might imagine sometime in the future of increased reliance on deformation modeling, not as a study, not like we did a year or two years ago, I'll get back to you with an answer in six months. So it's now fast enough to cycle in to the decisions during construction and subsequent operation that this will become um, a, 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 a let's call it routine basis for major projects going forward. And in fact, it's happening today in, in my practice in several locations. To indicate the challenge for regulation, because 
We don't do this on our own on these major structures. We have a burden to uh, ensure that our material, our, our products can be seen to be safe and can be regulated effectively. At the moment in, the, in Alberta, where, where I live, we're about to have dam safety guidelines, triggered a little bit from tailings dams issues, but nevertheless, this will apply to water dams, that will not specify minimum factors of safety. We're going to go away, and this is based on input from a variety of stakeholders of dam operators and mining companies and distinguished consultants and the like. But what will be going into the guideline, what will be going into the requirements are the need to consider consequence of failure, to need to consider different kinds of uncertainty, the need to consider dilative versus contractive response, the need to consider strain weakening and things like that, the need to consider time dependent deformation, and so forth. You can read all the things that need to be considered, and if we've missed something out uh, in due course, one can make additional requirements. So the, 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 if you like, the, the standard of design is going to go up by compliance with this, the factors of safety might change. They might sometimes be higher than 1.5. They might often be lower than 1.5, depending upon the kinds of materials you're dealing with. I was involved in a project not too many weeks ago in which, for various reasons, we don't want to initiate any strain weakening because of the implications of a runaway shear band at residual developing, and that implied, in order to avoid that being initiated, implied the equivalence of a factor of safety 1.7. 1.5 wouldn't be high enough, and those of you who understand the mechanics of these things will, will, uh, will, will, will understand exactly what I'm talking about. So, um, the, now you need, of course, you need uh, savvy owners, you need engineering, uh, capabilities and you need a regulatory system that can understand what's on this picture. Uh, we think that at least in the community uh, where I live we have those, but that's not going to be the case everywhere. And I just want to indicate some of the projections that are out there um, uh, that, that are affecting, affecting the uh, practice uh, we are. And the fundamental question is the bottom, is this kind of requirement from a design for specified as a design requirement is this the way forward to maximize trust and public safety? Because on these critical issues, whether it's slopes, whether it's dams, it's all about trust and public safety. And you'll see when I get to the end of the lecture, we have a very severe issue about trust in our activities. The next um, sub-theme, so to speak, that I want to um, go on to is under the title of mobility and risk. In 1978, um, I wrote a paper called Mobile Soil and Rock Flows. Forgive me for quoting my own stuff, but it's been kind of fun to go back and see what I wrote. It says, it appears that from an engineering point of view, the motions of mobile flows in the design of protective structures should proceed using principles of fluid mechanics rather than the more common considerations of shearing resistance in soil and rocks. However, a considerable effort is needed to systematically classify soil and rock flows and to understand the processes whereby they become fluidized. Uh, this paper uh, that's, that's cited here was triggered by four, four cases that I was involved in at the time that was certainly stretching everything I knew, and one was, of course, Sao Ma Ping and its fluidity, not the fact that it failed, but the flow. Uh, another was some debris flows in Western Canada called the Port Alice debris flow. I was involved in a, a landslide complex in, in uh, outside of, uh, on, on the Sierra, just outside of uh, Sao Paulo in Brazil, called the Grota Funda Slide, in which landslides and residual soils were gathered on a plateau. Rain was coming down, they were being pushed off the plateau and forming uh, major, what we would now call debris flows, with large core stones banging in uh, to, the, to the foundation of a bridge and so on. So the concepts of, of friction and cohesion and factors of safety um, uh, were, weren't, uh, we, we, made up some fluid mechanics to, to handle that. The, uh, so that was all part of this learning uh, that, 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 that I was going through at that time. And the fourth one is a very large uh, rock wall north of Vancouver, uh, which was uh, collapsed, I think it's dated 1850, 1855, and flowed out uh, for several kilometers and was clearly in a fluidized state with no evidence of why there could be any pore pressures. It was really a huge uh, day site cliff that collapsed, fragments flowed, and that was uh, there were issues of whether one could build on that or whether it could be repeated again and so on. They're all 
challenging things, and that prompted this kind of um, kind of uh, projection of, of what's happening in the future, and, and of course with the interest in in, in mobility and so forth here in Hong Kong, uh, you're, you've been part of part of the solution. Probably the most important contribution that we made uh, to this was to uh, was to encourage our dear and departed friend Aldrich Hunger to undertake this as for his PhD study at the um, uh, University of Alberta. And he died, uh, for those of you who know him, we all miss him. He was, would have been here with us uh, if not, and it's a time to reflect on the, all the wonderful things that he's done in this area and related aspects of landslide engineering. So his thesis was on the dynamics of rock avalanches and other types of slope movements, and then an enormous amount of, 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 of creative activity, both in the field and analytically, uh, to, to perhaps, uh, not his last publication, but, but a kind of uh, capstone publication, the Heim Lecture uh, delivered uh, just a year ago that summarized um, a, a, a tremendous amount of work that he's done um, on, on these related subjects. Um, we had uh, worked together on a number, and one of them was uh, is refer a number of mobility issues, and one is referenced here under the aegis of, of, uh, of GEO, in which we uh, uh, helped uh, uh, to participate in an excellent benchmarking exercise and landslide debris runout and mobility modeling, and, and the literature and the methods and all of those have exploded uh, since, since that uh, early, early prognosis of mine. Uh, Aldrich's capacity lives on through uh, his student, Scott McDougall, who's assumed his uh, position at the University of British Columbia, and he uh, recently uh, published a Canadian Geotechnical Colloquium paper, which is a paper that honors bright young engineers, and if you'd like a, a summary of the current practice and challenges, uh, that's a place to go. I'm not going to spend time on the um, rheology of these things, uh, because the state of practice, and I, I'm not pursuing here some of the arcane theories other than a little bit. I was tempted to do a little more. A relatively simple rheology is commonly assumed in back analysis, and as noted by, by Aldrich, the rheology specified in all these models is not a true material characteristic, but a representation of the bulk flow resistance as evidenced by the behavior of full-scale case histories, Thus, the rheological parameters cannot be independently measured, but must be determined by calibration. And that's the practical world we're living in. I know many of you here who are interested in that are doing more fundamental work, but that's basically if we have a project and we want to do a projection, that's the database that we employ. Uh, and I classify uh, all of these things into two, into two uh, ways of generating fluidization. One are wet systems. There might be collapsed liquefaction because of looseness. There are uh, generation of pore pressures during particle breakdown and sliding stuff, such as, uh, such as demonstrated by Professor Sass in Japan and so on. And then there are the very enigmatic dry flows that uh, also behave in a fluid behavior for no apparent reason. And these are a vibrational or acoustic fluidization, dynamic mode fragmentation, which particles are banging into each other and, and, and momentum is being transferred to the particle level. And I just wanted to share with you one set of experiments before I go on to the, uh, the risk part of, of, uh, of, of this presentation uh, that we recently did on some sands and glass beads in which we uh, took uh, uh, material and then sheared it in the shear box, uh, got rid of the dilatancy and got down to the steady state, if you like. And then we applied vibrations, forced vibrations to the system, knowing that we weren't generating uh, the, the, the dilatant state. So what we're seeing is the product, not a void ratio change, but the product of the applied vibration. And you can see here, that once you stop vibrating, it goes back to its conventional static or quasi-static strength, but with vibrations, there is a loss of resistance. And uh, these are some of the details of the vibrations. And uh, if we look at uh, a suite of these um, uh, materials with different degrees of applied vibrations, you can see that we have actually got rid, at this vibration level, of shear strength. In this, in this system. We have no shearing resistance. 
under these vibrations. Now we know, for example, oh dear, what's happened to me? We know, for example, in some of these rock slides that you can hear, you can measure seismic motions. We know that there are things happening at the base and those of you who are doing large experiments can see the particles banging into each other. So I point out that this may well be uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the concept of acoustic fluidization that a geophysicist called Mellish uh, speculated about with uh, some, some kind of related experiments, but very small scale, uh, uh, some years ago. And, uh, uh, and, and just, I don't say, I just put this to you to indicate that our ability to understand the physics in some of these flowing systems is still at a fairly limited level. And, and this is an illustration of that. Uh, the capacity that we have developed uh, over the last decade or two to actually uh, uh, monitor and compute the mobility really exploded the opportunity for doing quantitative risk assessment. And that's my next sub-theme under this, this class of discussions. So quantitative risk analysis applied to landslides is certainly well understood in the Hong Kong community. And this, you were the first government regulatory system to formally adopt tolerable landslide risk criteria in practice. Um, I quote here Andrew Malone's wonderful uh, paper that uh, gives the story of the work that was being done, the uh, first of the development thinking, uh, the, the calibration of, of the risk criteria, and all of those of those of us who were here at the time, at the time of the Kung Lung Lao slide, to, to participate in assisting GEO to make its case before LegCo and get the concept of risk-based landslide management into practice. Um, as it happens, um, uh, the uh, Oldridge Hunger and I and some others tied to an assignment related to risk in a, in a certain community undertook an international survey, and I think the paper reference comes later on, of what other countries are actually have regulation embodied in, uh, in that are quantitative risk analysis. Uh, now it's, I'm talking within public policy. It's a very different world when you're in the private sector working with a mining company or something like that, making a risk-based decision. It comes quite naturally. But the issue of converting the kinds of calculations we do into public policy it raises challenges of, of risk communication, which I'll speak about in a little more, that are totally underestimated. And the first community that actually solved that problem, and I think uh, and exactly how it was done is in Andrew's paper, is actually Hong Kong. I think, I'll, I'll tell you now, that the only other country that we've identified where such a bridge into public policy, into regulation, is in Canada, and you'll see how we've imported, as it happens, the Hong Kong criteria into community developments in a couple occasions in Canada. So this, I believe, was a watershed in the application of QRA to landslide hazards in practice. And the history, as I'll repeat, was in the seminal development uh, has been written by, by Andrew Malone, who's here. Now, let me illustrate. Ah, so we're going to inquire whether this, which all of you here will recognize as, as, as uh, your risk tolerance criteria, um, how it's migrated out of Hong Kong into practice in two case histories in Canada. So the first is um, the district of North Vancouver, which if you like is a suburb of Vancouver. Those of you who know Vancouver, it's on the north side, uh, close to the mountains that shroud, uh, that shroud the city on the north side. And in January 15th, uh, you've all seen pictures of storms because you get wonderful pictures here from your Met office and so on. Uh, you can see a, a uh, uh, fairly intense for us uh, storm migrating to, that, to the uh, on land. Uh, uh, on January 15th, 2005. Uh, the implications of this storm was to create debris flows off, the, um, off a, uh, uh, an, a, an escarpment 
uh, in which these uh, landslides are indicated. We'll get into a little more detail. So the major part of Vancouver is down perhaps around the floor here. This is the uh, uh, Seymour River, for those who know it, uh, the, uh, is an escarpment, and we're dealing with events that happen up here uh, during this intense storm. So January 19th, it occurred early in the morning, uh, storm rainfall 175 millimeters. The initial failure that triggered a fatality was 20 meters wide, which enlarged to 26 meters. The volume was ultimately a few thousand cubic meters, the runout length 160 meters, and a runout angle 21 to 23 degrees. Not a dramatic uh, phenomenon in, in terms of, of debris flow features, but unfortunately located in a channelized setting uh, that, uh, that aimed it straight at a house and resulted in, in a major tragedy. So we're dealing with uh, an extremely rapid earth flow depending, on your, uh, depending upon uh, one's terminology or flow slide. Here you see the situation um, that the uh, channelization came down. There's a house here and you can uh, read uh, from the, uh, the news forecast, woman killed in massive North Vancouver slide, <coughs> husband hurt, damaged, uh, two homes smashed, etc. Uh, and a number of other uh, homes, if you look at the bottom, fearing more landslides, about 80 homes in the area have been evacuated until experts declare that it's safe to return. So you can imagine, and some of you have been in this situation, there you are, you've got 80 people, 80 families, you've got the tragedy of uh, fatality to deal with, uh, it's still raining, uh, it's not the end of the rainy season, and what are you going to do? How are you going to get, what criteria will you use to get people back in the house? What criteria will you use to assess what needs to be done, uh, whether anything needs to bun, be done? One, some might be fatalistic and say, well, these things don't happen very often. Let's not do anything. Those are attitudes that you encounter. Uh, we decided that um, the logic for what to do merited an analytical framework and recommended to uh, the District of North Vancouver that uh, we would employ, we being myself and, and, and the consulting company, BGC, who are doing the work, uh, bring in the Hong Kong risk tolerance criteria as a basis for decision making. And uh, they agreed because otherwise it was going to be arm waving without anything uh, uh, other than your opinion and my opinion and a lot of diverse opinions. It's a pretty open society and lots of opinions. So that was supported. The geological setting is not very complicated. There had been a glacial advance. Uh, and I guess glaciers left this part of the world about 8,000 years ago, laying down some till, marine inundation. There's a river of uh, uplift and down cutting and residential development and the colluvial uh, colluvial covering on the slope that uh, was the, 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 if you like, the, the base for the, the flow out, and various degrees of over steepening. People extended their lots with retaining walls and so on. So there's a bunch of, a bunch of source zones scattered around the escarpment over these 80 houses uh, that, that differ in kind. So these are the, these are the uh, circumstances. Uh, the uh, the type, the initiation was uh, at the crest under this uh, intensive rainfall and, uh, and, the, and turned into the flow debris that you saw in the channelized flow. So one had to now develop the analysis. Now, in Hong Kong, the, um, this phase of, of, if you like, characterizing the model is made easier by virtue of your historical database that's been collected. You've got, I don't know how many hundred uh, run out examples with various slopes and d different characteristics that gives you some basis for moving forward with a risk calculation. Uh, we had to reform that because the amount of, we don't have exactly that kind of database, but basically we were going to calculate a risk in terms of potential loss of life 
the probability of occurrence, number of fatalities, it's going to be the met usual metric of potential loss of life, and here's the algebra that is uh, understood based on the position of homes and run out behavior of previous slides. Fortunately, you'll see on the next slide that we had some information to help do that. Uh, the vulnerability in terms of utilization, um, the uh, uh, some, so, some intensity measure based on the consequence of previous slides and the, uh, the utilization of the homes, and these are all uh, characteristics that went into the, uh, uh, into the calculation of fatalities. Fortunately, there, there have been, in a sense fortunately from the point of view of doing a, a QRA, there had been uh, landslides along this escarpment before. There had been some that had created no damage. Uh, there were some that had destroyed a house and damaged another house. So one did have a database to parse these, pro the, the, these differences, slight differences of inclination, slight differences in over steepening in the backyards and all those sorts of things. And, and uh, uh, that became the backbone that is equivalent to your uh, much larger database of, of runout. Now, interesting point that I have here is the, the value of preserving corporate memory. You never quite know when records will be essential. And, and if we uh, didn't have uh, this degree of corporate memory, that's all we had, uh, one would be increasingly speculative. The value of a QRA when it comes to influencing public policy, and I'll make this point in more detail with the next case history, is that it honors everything you know. And therefore, it is a strong basis to argue against those who say, oh, let's not do anything, or argue against says that those who oh, don't want to have any risk at all, and all those other things. You have a compelling case to put forward that everything that you know is embedded in the QRA. And that is very powerful when one is doing multi-stakeholder consultation. So that kind of, uh, that, that kind of calculus, if you will, was uh, we, we broke the crest into 75 increments. Uh, their ranking was based on thickness of fill. There, there are different drainage conditions. Some uh, the water wouldn't get in off the road. It was drained away, and some it would get in. Uh, slope angles, evidence of past movement from air photos, and all that kind of stuff. And one then kind of had an average condition and uh, sort of a normalization to distinguish the different setups whether the house would be so badly at risk that it should be bought and destroyed, whether, um, whether minor changes, or whether it was adequately protected from any channelization and trees that it was safe. And remember, ultimately, the outcome of this was not going to be handled by the public purse alone. So ultimately, one was going to have, be persuading private landowners to participate in, in, in improving they're uh, uh, reducing their personal risk level with some public money. So there's a, uh, it, 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 the, the, if you like, the, the game is, is more, more complex uh, under those conditions. So uh, run out assessments were done with some calculations to assist and, and, and uh, this illustrates the variation of, uh, of, uh, calc of, uh, of uh, outcomes that uh, uh, some, uh, I guess the yellow ones, were locations where the damage would be possible, but it was most likely uh, uh, fluid effects. Um, the, the red ones were extreme events in terms of um, focusing and channelization and, and uh, steeper slopes and so forth and so on. So that was the, the differentiation that, uh, that we made in that case. And um, the dominant criterion is, is uh, for existing slopes, uh, 10 to the minus 4 per year was the target from a risk tolerance point of view. There was no new development here, but that went into the public policy later on. And so it was dominated by indi individual risk, uh, and the calculations proceeded on that basis. So here is the distribution. One found that uh, there were um, all these pinky uh, locations uh, 51 properties at the base of the escarpment, one property at the crest that was very close uh, were uh, was already being undercut by instability, uh, exceeded uh, the, uh, the risk uh, tolerance number. Uh, the, the yellow were in between and some, uh, some were sufficiently low that, uh, that they, they need not uh, 
to worry about. Some were sufficiently severe that the municipality actually bought the houses and destroyed them at presumably some fair market value. So um, that, this is the final unacceptable risk source zone, and you, you can understand uh, some are in the ALARP zone, some would just require minor changes to improve, and some, the blue ones, were broadly acceptable. And that was the outcome of the quantified risk analysis that now had to be transmitted into public policy. So um, the public policy aspect is now in play, and one can't just say, let's do that. You have to persuade a lot of people to do this, to act on the outcome of this, and, and, and so on. So there is um, um, an issue of the, of the uh, conversations, if you will, discussions about establishing tolerable risk. And I decline, as a matter of principle, from actually telling any community or telling any stakeholder what his, her, or their tolerable risk should be. I can help inform that discussion, but this is a very complicated social judgment to actually say that. So the position that those, that, that a group of us who work a little bit in this area is that stakeholders, jurisdictions, and decision makers ultimately have to select, ideally by means of an appropriate public process, the appropriate risk evaluation parameters as a probability, landslide volume, peak discharge, which go in to the kind of calculation for a particular situation or jurisdiction. This selection has to balance the risks from landslides with societal values. Societal value includes such things as public safety, affordable residential land, return on investment. So these aren't things that we as geotechnical engineers, we are, understand them, but we're not custodians of all of those things. So one wants to create an environment in which the multi-stakeholders can participate and evaluate their options within the framework that we as technical advisors have produced for them. Um, and that, in this particular case, was done very effectively in Vancouver. Um, the, uh, uh, if you would uh, like to uh, read the details of how it was executed, how the risk communication was presented, in the various stages of, of, of community forums and all the rest in order to get the, get the information up to the elected officials who would then vote on things. You'll find a paper by a student of ours who recently, uh, who, who recently finished uh, her PhD on, on things that involve risk communication on the District of North Vancouver's landslide management strategy, role of public involvement for determining tolerable risk and increasing community resilience in the journal Natural Hazards. And briefly, um, we gave them, I was a little involved, but she gave them, I should say, a very good rating from all the things they did compared to our experience in some other locations in terms of representative participation early involvement in this process, so that as the risk analysis was unfolding, people were being briefed what it was all about. They didn't just meet a senior geotechnical engineer three months later with a compl complicated report with run-out calculations on They were briefed on the way, information availability in the public, and understanding of impact on policy. Uh, this now is a regulation in the District of North Vancouver. If you want to develop land there, you have to undertake a risk evaluation meeting the Hong Kong criteria, uh, as described, at least in terms of potential loss of life. The District of North Vancouver has received international recognition for their natural hazard management program, of which the landslide management strategy forms an important part. In 2011, they received the United Nations Sasakawa Award for Disaster Risk Reduction. And in 2012, when the United Nations published the handbook, How to Make Cities More Resilient, the District of North Vancouver was recognized an example of innovation and community engagement. You can take, I think, uh, those of you here who started this execution in public policy, I think some feeling of pride that you've got a, a, a relative now spinning off the initiatives that, that started here in Hong Kong. It was important, 
it was important as we began this exercise to, to uh, comfort, if you will, the elected officials of, of the District of North Vancouver and say, look, they've been through this in Hong Kong and they've sorted out that this is a reasonable criterion and here's some references and so on, et cetera. So uh, um, uh, this, this has been a, a positive experience and it now fed in to another case history. Now, how do I do this? Uh, what do I, I forgot, but I have to point something here. Just with the video. Yes, with this? Oh, that, sorry, I got nothing to do. <laughs> you've got the idea. There were, there were remarkable people operating equipment stopping debris from accumulating around places that it could have taken out the bridge. There was no loss of life. There was a uh, very successful evacuation um, and certainly loss of, loss of buildings under this debris flow. Now this creek uh, is not an unattended creek. Uh, it had the, the, the creek had a flood design designed to, I'm not proud of the standard of flood design in Alberta at that time, it was a 100 year flood design, but it was designed totally as a hydraulic facility, so it had a riprap channel designed to return period of 100. It wasn't designed for debris. In fact, they had recently rebuilt the lining at several million Canadian dollars expense and it went out in about 10 minutes. And so the issue was, here we have um, another uh, situation in which uh, we have uh, evacuated people and we have uh, a situation to deal with. Uh, these are just some further pictures of, uh, of the Cougar Creek, the loss of the, I think down below is the Trans-Canada Highway, um, it, it's out as well, and, and so on. So there are major dislocations, but the, uh, uh, due, to, due to this facility. You can see very substantial, uh, lovely houses actually uh, uh, suffering a great deal of damage. So the question then arose, well, what are we going to do with this? Uh, I, an advisor uh, to the town, and actually the colleagues who actually worked in North Vancouver were also retained uh, to, uh, to uh, provide technical information on, on where are we going with this because clearly they had been through a raft of hydraulic consultants who kept doing, who kept doing hydraulic design of, of channels and clearly, uh, clearly that was not suitable. One had to design for debris systems. It's, it's, a, it's a relatively steep mountain creek and it's not a surprise that debris flows and debris floods would be characteristic and there's a very substantial fan that's been built up and it's a very nice place to live because it's a little higher and so on and one might say you shouldn't do that and that's correct but it's done and you can't move out i can't remember 700 houses things like that so one had to work through um, some uh, protection what i'm showing you here is uh, the result of calculated risk uh, and this is the end product uh, I'll take you through how we got there, but basically a quantitative risk assessment was conducted that said, look for all of the uncertainty in which we do this, and I'll take you through the, uh, the components that, that go into, into that in a moment. Uh, we're not in a comfort level by virtue of the standards that uh, we respect that have come from Hong Kong and which we put in place in, 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 uh, in uh, Vancouver. And, uh, uh, there is 
if you care about these things, you should be doing something, and therefore one should develop some decision process based on tolerable risk and move, move this further down into the ALARP range. Um, that, not everybody agreed with that. There were some said, well, look, this isn't going to happen very often. Why should we do anything? And so that this is part of this, on, uh, part of this discussion that will unfold as we begin to develop the uh, quantitative risk argument uh, that, that will lead, lead to risk-based decision-making in due course. So one had to first get to these calculations and, and, uh, and then begin to find mitigation measures to bring us here, then go through the process of risk communication, not only to private stakeholders, but to three levels of government. This is a local town, if you will, which ultimately would be the custodian of this facility and ultimately bear some costs. We had to go through the province, which had some money for emergency measures. This is a major flood we had in southern Alberta and the federal government also. So it had, had to, a lot of overseers had to buy in to what was going to come out of this. And uh, the town supported our recommendation to proceed on a risk-based um, uh, assessment. So this illustrates some of the outcomes of, of the, the one, once we've got some uh, hazard quantification of a f frequency magnitude, which we'll come to in a minute. You can then run it through the runout model and you can calculate a potential uh, loss of life at various locations based on the population distribution. I'll go through these components in a moment, but basically these are the kinds of, of, uh, of calculations that come out of the quantification. When you get to this stage and you've honored everything you know meteorologically, and you've honored everything you know geologically, and you've honored everything you know about the population distribution and so on and so forth, it's very compelling. It's hard for the, the naysayers to say, oh, I don't much care about that. And, and my experience is that's one of the positive aspects of the QRA exercise, notwithstanding its own intrinsic uncertainty. Nobody, nobody is saying these calculations are correct to, 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 to two decimals or things like that. So anyways, that's the kind of outcome. So how do we get to there? I would add that when you get into this arena, you find yourself engaged in more than technical discussions, and I just uh, put, put, uh, put this, this statement uh, that, that uh, was in part of, the, part of the, the risk communication to stakeholders about why there's a need to do something and why this is good. Uh, a good practice, you end up uh, talking about both moral and, and other aspects of, of, of risk mitigation and so forth. So I just, just indicate that we end up employing vocabularies that, that, aren't, uh, that aren't found in geotechnical textbooks. So the first aspect, now we don't have the difference between the, the let's call it the first uh, the first exercise and activities and, uh, from Hong Kong, which then translated North Vancouver, which had some database. We don't have a database. So we have to create a database for the magnitude of debris flood, debris flows, to then do a run on analysis and do that sort of calculation. So we have to now exhume the fan. So what you see are deep test pits in the fan. Uh, so you have to, have to do geomorphology and geology, my colleagues, I think, will be pleased to see that. And you can see different episodes. You can see the different class sizes and so on. Uh, you can do uh, some dating. Uh, we've got certain ashes that we can date. We can do dendrochronology and so on. So there's a scientific exercise to, to penetrate the evolution of the fan to give us magnitude frequency information of past events. So that's a starting point. And this is what you end up. Uh, this is this is return period of uh, just hydrological stuff. That's quite straightforward, and that really isn't what we're after. We're after more extreme events, and uh, there's a reason why one ends up with a separate distribution. The actual flood event that occurred was something the order of a uh, little more than one in three hundred, around uh, around one in 350 or something like that. It wasn't anything grossly extreme, but certainly much more than the, the hydraulic design. We believe we could see, or we had, there was evidence when it was coming down, which, which you, we didn't see in the video, that it was pulsing. 
and that indicated that there were debris dams being formed up in the watershed that were breaking. It was the only way in which you could get that kind of unsteady behavior. So, so we, we think that we were transitional between a debris flow and a debris flood in terms of mobility. And this would be, these things are the, the, the more rare big dams that formed and then came out. And there was opportunity to build structures. Uh, build dams up in the watershed that, that not, not dams for con natural dams that would have stored debris and then failed. And come. In fact, there had been a small dam on the watershed some 10 or 15 years ago that did fail during the flood, but it wasn't appreciated that, that debris was the controlling element. Of course, debris is water is different because it degrades and blocks and all your channel stability disappears for those of you who, who haven't uh, gone through uh, thinking about uh, fluvial hydraulics in this sense. So this becomes a basis for, um, for um, selecting the, um, selecting the, the uh, variation of, of design. And so we have a frequency magnitude relationship that we've just talked about. Uh, the debris flow modeling has various scenarios of extent and flow depth and so on. Uh, the rheology was, um, that we used was, uh, we, there was no reason to be very complicated and the, f the computer program Flow2D, uh, which handles uh, this kind of stuff very efficiently, was adequate for our purposes. Then the risk assessment, one needed to the spatial analysis of vulnerability, the mapping of here's this building with that occupancy under these conditions, all of that goes into the calculation, the loss of life. We'll come to that in a moment. So all of the spatial, temporal aspects that go into the model that you build, and we'll get to mitigation options in a moment. A critical aspect of how to convert the runout analysis into loss of life is work that uh, my good friend and, and, and his colleagues, uh, Matthias Jacob, has published on vulnerability of buildings to debris flow impact. So there is an intensity factor, which is depth times velocity squared. It's kind of an energy of the debris, and that has a relationship with some data. Uh, not, not clear data, but it allows you to make judgments about where, when the debris flow is t attacking this house, whether it's benign or not benign, and so on. So uh, those of you who've been through it know that there's judgment, but it, the judgment is better than doing nothing. So all of these things go into the modeling, and you saw the kind of outcomes of the model. So we ended up with um, um, a, a risk-based, we have calculated that the risk of using those magnitude frequency relationship is intolerable, and what are we going to do? What's the mitigation basis? Now, the, my suggestion, and with others, uh, to the town was the discussion on what to do should be based on certain issues, certain general concepts of feasibility, fairness, and affordability. So whatever we're going to do had to be feasible. Uh, by the way, for temporary measures, there was already a, a flexible barrier fence put up in the gorge just to collect things that might come the next year and so forth. So that was just a stopgap. But the, in terms of uh, designing based on what we had, well, that was not going to do the trick. So within those criteria, one then had a spectrum. One would say, some would say, it's not going to happen for another 100 years. Let's not do anything. Some would say, oh, we can't live with that threat living here. We don't want to have any risk. And that, that's the kind of variation that had to be worked through the public system. Um, and uh, we uh, recommended uh, to, the, to the town to develop focus groups. There wasn't a lot of time. To, to get a solution going, not as much time as at North Vancouver, but they, they brought focus groups together so that people within the community were being alerted to the decision process that was ultimately going to go on in the town council. And uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the town council then took various, uh, various concepts and made a decision based on these overarching criteria, uh, recognizing we had to honor tolerable risk tied to the Hong Kong criteria. Uh, the final solution was to, uh, was to uh, end up with the debris flood retention structure based pretty much on practice, though somewhat uh, uh, better detailed, I think, than, than what uh, is done in Austria. 
Uh, so it's an earth and rock-filled embankment dam. It doesn't retain water during regular operations. It's a dry dam, and the water flows freely through an outlet. The outlet is protected by a rake that prevents blockage by woody debris and large boulders. Uh, <clears throat> the structure is going to be about 30 meters high, uh, about 150 meters long. It's sized for the 300-year event. If one went to a bigger event, and this is part of the discussion that the community and the, the, the decision makers are making, well, let's go to the thousand-year event. Well, one could have done that. It might have cost extra money, but the thousand-year event would have been sufficiently large that the retention zone would have, been, would have penetrated into a wilderness park that is a protected area. So that was one of the values. Uh, these are the multiple values that, 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 uh, that had to be managed, so that, that was a discouragement plus the cost. Uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, of going to minimizing the risk uh, 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 theoretically. This in itself is, is uh, not a trivial structure. It's just going through its final, final uh, approval um, uh, by the dam safety people in Alberta. This illustrates what it will look like. This is a, it's placed into Photoshop into the canyon, uh, and uh, I think the, uh, uh, the uh, you can see. Uh, the, the outlet here is actually through the dam, but uh, we have an option to bring the water out through a tunnel on the right-hand side. This is down uh, on this side, and, and I and others favor that and expect that we'll be, we'll be doing that. And uh, now th these decisions don't come lightly because these need, need maintenance in perpetuity. So you have to have a discussion, well, I'm storing debris if I don't clean it out on a regular basis, and so I'm going to make things worse. I'm going to have this dam that's going to now get flooded and going to bring even more debris down. And so there's a, a social social contract, in a way, uh, that the community has to buy into in maintenance. So uh, this is uh, the, uh, this is the, if you like, the second example uh, of uh, the, the uh, application of the Hong Kong criteria. And I've produced this out here because if you look down, um, you'll read, and this is now the uh, public policy statement for the town of Canmore for all the steep creeks around. This is not just Cougar Creek, there are a number of mountain creeks. And you'll see the town's objective is to avoid and reduce intolerable risk associated with steep creek hazards. And therefore, you must, somewhere in here, it says you must undertake a risk analysis. So the kind of risk analysis that we're talking about is now part of public policy for development. Developers don't like it because they don't like having intrusions, but this is part of the, part of the social balance that, that, uh, that, that one has had to work through. The, uh, I just would repeat that uh, the challenge of risk communication in uh, these open societies is equal to or even greater than the challenge of, of the quantification of risk. And that brings me to an interesting table uh, that, that, uh, that, that illustrates where we might be internationally in this regard. This is a table uh, produced in a U.S. National Research Council report. And this is a series of reports that flowed out of the Katrina disaster. Katrina disaster raised the debate in the United States for resilience. And we've been talking about resilience yesterday and today. And this particular report is on dam and levee safety and community resilience and so on. And, and it isn't, this, I'm not going into the details of this report, but it had this very interesting maturity matrix for assessing community engagement. And that struck me as, uh, as uh, important uh, for all of us to understand. So there is, you can imagine that we're talking about debris flow or whatever it is. This is so level one community, there is no activity. So this is clearly a, a country or a region that is in a very primitive, very early state of development. Level two is standards-based only. So its technology is prescriptive completely, and we understand in these things that there's more flexibility needed, to, not just because of engineering creativity, but you might sterilize a lot of land, whatever, but that's the next level. Level three is introduction of additional review, failure modes, kind of an kind of help you with a qualitative risk analysis to make decisions. Level four, application of quantitative risk assessment by using criteria developed by owner regulator with input from community members and stakeholders. And I think 
that's probably uh, what was the experience at Hong Kong. Application of quantitative risk assessment by using criteria that reflect the community, or, or, or five is, it's four and five are not all that different, but this is where we are. But if you look at the exposure to landslide hazards, the exposure around the world is actually way down in levels one and two. And that, uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, should make us remember that while, uh, while we have some creativity and some, some potential application of this, that from an international perspective, uh, based on our review of, of where other countries are in terms of putting risk into public policy, that the, uh, the greatest impact of landslide hazards is in the developing world, which is down into level one and two. And we therefore shouldn't forget uh, those who work in this area that our approach to landslide hazard and risk control should be made simpler and more transparent for those kinds of communities so that it can be exported to people who most need it. However, having said that as a, as a kind of conscience statement about what's out in the world, uh, I think we're going to see more of the applications of QRA. There are already two other communities that are engaging in this process, uh, both in British Columbia, and one, by, by agreeing to a major dam, will release a very substantial amount of land, but also reduce the risk on this location that has multiple debris flows. Those of you who know the literature might know the Chikai Fan location, and that's probably going to go the same way that we went in, went in Canmore. Um, but there are very interesting ethical questions about insurance that have to be dealt with, about, gee, I've licensed land, the land hasn't been developed, but everybody agrees we can develop it, but what if we get it wrong, and all those other issues that, that are part of the multi-stakeholder discussion of which we're only a part, we don't own it all. But it's a very positive outcome of growth from the work that had its origins here in, in Hong Kong. So I thought you'd be interested to know about that. I want to turn to the last technical um, session, uh, which I titled Professional Practice. And I found in the Lum Lecture that I delivered here in year 2000, the following statement toward the end of the lecture. The assurance of geotechnical performance would be enhanced if geotechnical engineering shifted from the promise of certainty to the analysis of uncertainty. Um, the intent of that lecture, for those who are there might remember, was to draw attention firstly to the fact we're not very good at prediction in geotechnical engineering. Uh, we are plagued with these kinds of uncertainty. Uh, I uh, provided a number of examples of difficult ground conditions that are not uncommon to illustrate the kinds of uncertainty we have to deal with, and also provided an example of a very challenging structure that was successfully completed, uh, simply making the point that to, to get to a positive end, you've got to integrate all kinds of things, analysis and observations and geophysics and site characterization, all the kinds of things that, that we know about, but sometimes forget to do. Uh, and the uncertainties that, in my ta terminology that I'm going to come to, come, come down and look at, were firstly parameter uncertainty, the variations of the friction value or something like that. A model uncertainty is the limit analysis or a finite element or other things, the appropriate uh, assessment of behavior. And human uncertainty. Human uncertainty can arise from a number of things. Uh, Kung Lung Lao is an example of human uncertainty because of issues in the records that led to, led to failure. Uh, there are all kinds of other people make mistakes. We're going to see at the end of the lecture some grievous mistakes in our practice and so on. So the, the end of this lecture uh, is tending to make some summary reflections on the progress that we've made dealing with these different kinds of uncertainty. Uh, the first that I want to talk about is parameter uncertainty. And uh, there's been, a, and this is basically a, 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 a discussion on the fact that we might have a statistical variability of properties 
and, uh, and uh, how are we dealing with that? There's been, of course, an enormous advance in probabilistic analysis. Uh, and so we asked ourselves a question, not being a uh, great theoretician, certainly uh, a great uh, statistician um, some, some 16 years ago in this thesis. Uh, what is the probability of failure of a safe slope or a safe bed? That is, one that is safe by conventional design criteria, what is the probability of failure? So we answered that question in a variety of ways. One, we took a structure, this is a major tailings dam at the Syncrete Oil Sand Project that was completed with difficulty. There was shearing here and resistance and all sorts of things and poor pressures and all of that. And this has been well reported in the literature. I actually cited this as a success in the, LAM in the LUM lecture if you want to look back at it. And this was completed to a factor of safety 1.3, which is our target factor of safety, and a lot of data. So we we're going to analyze this. This is a, uh, as a, and see what its probability of failure, taking the variable data, doing the Monte Carlo simulations and all of that sort of stuff. The other kind of analyses that we did is we took some of the classical case histories that underpin the validity of our stability, the Lodalin landslide failure of the 50s, which is a wonderful little clean case history that first gave us confidence in the application of effective stress analysis and so on. So it had a factor of safety, of, I can't remember, unity or 1.05. We then would do the statistical probabilistic analysis and say, well, it had a very high probability of failure. That's a comfort that the two was give, meet, met, meeting reality. And then we would redesign it. We would say instead of whatever its slope was, two to one, we would make it uh, uh, three to one, and that would have a factor of safety in conventional terms of a certain number. And we'd redo the probabilistic analysis and then get a number calibrated with that case history. And so we did a number of things. Some were embankments on soft soil. Some were actually some, some slopes from Hong Kong and so forth. And I'm not going to go through all the details. They're all in this thesis and a number of papers that have been published. But just to illustrate the outcome. So here is uh, a, lot of the, a lot of that dam was, uh, was controlled by weak shear strength at another glacially driven uh, uh, clay shale interface. At residual strength, you can see we're ending up with design friction values of 7.5 degrees. So if I take the whole database, or the student took the whole database as opposed to screening things out and saying, this just reflected, this all came from legitimate laboratories, sampling and all the rest, it's sort of real world data. And there is a distribution of one property that's going to go into the probabilistic analysis. And uh, then you can then, there are other properties. There's the pore pressure, uh, pizza metric level, densities, other frictional properties and so on, plus, when you're dealing with this kind of analysis, it's our view that you also have to look at the architecture of the spatial variability of the properties, which is something called the autocorrelation variation. So it's a new parameter that you have to learn about, and that went into here, and I'm not going to go into the, the details of how to do this analysis, but it's all based just limited analyses with sampling procedures and Monte Carlo simulation. Here's a distribution of factor safety. And uh, I'm sorry. And, uh, am I not working? Oh, that should go forward. Okay, thank you, sorry. Um, so you get out of the Monte Carlo simulation, you get something very useful. You get uh, a ranking of saying here are the various inputs and, and which were the most contributing most to the uncertainty and that's helpful in your judgment, it's all good stuff. But the interesting thing that we're asking for, is there a design criterion based on the probabilistic analysis that would supersede our basis? reflects being able to calculate the uncertainty. So the property that uh, properly, the property reflects the probability of failure. We're actually saying, are we now designing to a certain probability of failure as opposed to a factor of safety? Is, uh, converts itself, depending upon the distributions, into the reliability index. And 
Uh, so we can calculate from the distribution of factors of safety for these cases, the reliability index, and we can plot them against the factor of safety of all these cases. And these are on this left-hand plot. All of the, we actually never got around to publishing this for some reason, but here it is. Um, the, so uh, first of all, these uh, full, do, full uh, squares are cases in which the, the reliability index is, is very low and the factor of safety is easy. These were the failures that we just calibrated on. And these are either safe structures like that uh, Taylor's Dam or cases that we made safe. And we make the observation that our safe structures by traditional geotechnical uh, 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 designs are operating in the world, except for I think this might be Lodalin, which has got fairly limited statistical distribution, might be, are all operating in the world of reliability index of maybe two, two to three. If you ask the reliability people, and these are all fairly extreme events, these were not all uh, activities in which you want to take a whole lot of risk, uh, where should you be just blanketly from, from uh, reliability and structure and so on? The answers you'll typically get is in the world of four, perhaps to three. So my sense of where we end up is we, we can do, we can manage the data uncertainty, we can conduct reliable probabilistic analyses, we will do more, but we're still on a learning curve and we will not reply, we will perhaps on major projects do it in consort with the more traditional methods as we learn to whether we can calibrate ourselves to work solely on probabilistic analyses. This may not be the case for local, fe local design fe features like PAWS and the like, but certainly it's our experience with these dams and slopes from these case histories. So I thought you'd be interested to have that positive, positive but halting assessment of where we might be going in terms of probabilistic analysis. We're going to be doing more of it. I must say, I'm only in terms of practical problems of, of, of significance, I think I'm only beginning to use it on one project. So just in terms of experience, and, and, and others will have different experience, it's been halting. But nevertheless, it's a tool that is coming of age. But, but uh, uh, this calibration basically said, we're used to taking more risk in geotechnical engineering than the pure probability people. And that's not news to us. We know that, or our lawyers know that. And, uh, and, and exactly how to calibrate that is a matter of, of some, some difficulty because of this, these logarithmic scales. But let me turn to um, the less positive aspects of my story. I know. <laughs> uh, just, just okay. yes. I spent the last couple of years doing forensic investigations into major Taylor's Dam disasters. This is the Pawnee Taylor's facility in the British Columbia. Failure occurred at night. This is a copper mine uh, with an intermediate sized company with consultants who are well known uh, in terms of experience. This is, not a, uh, a, a non, this is not an occurrence by people that nobody had ever heard of. Uh, this is in a, the province of British Columbia that uh, has a mature uh, uh, mining industry and a very effective regulatory, industry, uh, regulatory capa capability. There is a special uh, mining uh, inspectorate in one of the ministries that actually looks at mine pits and tailings dams, separate from the inspectorate that looks at water dams. And uh, yet this occurred. It's probably the most extreme uh, um, environmental disaster that British Columbia has had. Uh, the outcome of this was the province of British Columbia appointed an independent investigation panel that I was asked to chair. Uh, and uh, you're going to see some of the conclusions uh, uh, briefly from that. I would add that the, we insisted uh, that everything that, that we did 
uh, in the public domain. You can find the website on Mount Polly. You'll find our reports in detail. You'll find all the appendices of all the calculations, all the details of all the testing that was done and so forth, so that you needn't uh, take any special notes at the moment. Um, that's all in the public domain. Uh, I would add that um, after our investigation was tied to what happened, uh, after that, the mines inspector, who is the regulator, regulator, is required to undertake a separate investigation as to cause, to roles of responsibility. We, uh, for, we were precluded and precluded ourselves from answering those questions. And there is, uh, and that is also in the public domain. And there is a third uh, investigation, which is not yet complete, uh, for reasons I don't know, by what are called the conservation officers who are kind of the environmental police. That in principle, uh, this failure was a violation of the environmental law, and the environmental law, violation of the environmental law is a criminal act, and uh, the, uh, we're still waiting to hear whether uh, there will be serious fines or even worse things um, that flow from, from this grievous failure. Uh, the outflow, um, fortunately, there was no deaths. There could have been deaths with ease. It occurred, as I say, in the middle of the night. There was a wonderful camping area and fishing area downstream of the dam. There wasn't anybody there. Uh, much of the flow uh, went into a pristine lake that is an important spawning, uh, spawning lake so that there are potential impacts in the salmon industry a little bit. Plus, it's uh, land that's under the uh, uh, land that is under the control of one of our First Nations. So there's a multi multi-impact issue that uh, still is out there. Uh, there is, at, as we speak, uh, some civil litigation underway between the mine owner and the designer. So that's just some background. I'm not going just to tell you where we are, but let's see what happened. Uh, this is in plan, uh, the facility, uh, and uh, the uh, largest, the highest portion of the structure it's, a, of course, a tailings dam, and, and the earth fill structure and actually constructed in the downstream direction, which is a safer direction than the tailings. All lie up here. The land goes uphill, so you don't need any containment there. The highest part of the structure is here. The fader actually occurred here in the lower part of the structure, and that is diagnostic of some information. Uh, there are instrumented sections, but the actual location of the fader uh, there, there weren't any instruments at the time. Uh, this illustrates, uh, had you gone onto the site after the failure, you would see some interesting features. Uh, the, uh, we're looking into the breach. You, we've just flown through the breach. Uh, uh, we just, the helicopter went up here and looked around there. So we're looking <coughs> into the breach. And as you can see, here is uh, the left abutment, here is the right abutment, and downstream is here, and all the tailings float out as you in this direction. You can see a kind of W feature, and that's a thrust. So the ground has failed and thrust. This is the toe of the dislocation. Uh, clearly, all of these abutments are now gone, and we've uh, degraded back into, into the tailings there. Um, if we walked around the site, and looked at the left abutment from down on the ground, uh, you would see up-tilted, you'd see up-tilted bedding in the abutment, so clearly there has been a rotational, slightly rotational, it's mainly translation, it's moved out some many meters, it's created this thrust here, and there's been some tilting in the left abutment, indicating something to do with the kinematics. Uh, clearly, it is a, well, uh, our, our procedures um, do not jump to conclusions. Uh, you'll see that before we, um, we, we approach this by, by evaluating whether uh, there was overtopping, whether there was piping, and or whether there was even discussion of, of, uh, damage, uh, of, of sabotage in, in the communities. That was just had to be on the record. But I'm not going to go through, you can read our reports in detail. I just want to take you through the uh, the geotechnical aspects of the, of the uh, event. Geologically, the material uh, is on a bed of till here. Then there is a thin glacial lake layer. 
then there's a lower till, and then we're into bedrock. The dam is a is kind of a center line construction, indicating these are seasonal. It, build, it gets built in stages. As the da as the mine progresses, you build it in stages. These are platforms to be able to build on the tailings that are here, and they're rather thin uh, filter transition zones to a rather steep uh, uh, buttress uh, on the right-hand side. Uh, during the investigation, Glacial Lake deposits were identified, though not here. They were regarded as stiff and overconsolidated, and uh, not to be particularly consequential in the design. Uh, the, uh, so there was, uh, in any analysis that would have been done, this would have been treated with a frictional material, maybe 25 degrees or something like that, and uh, 30 degrees and stability analyses would have been performed. Uh, the uh, code requirements in British Columbia at the time followed the Canadian dam guidelines that uh, require a factor of safety of 1.5 in the long term, but allow 1.3 during construction. There's been a little laxity in building mining dams that continue for construction for a long period of time to use 1.3 during that, um, that period. Um, uh, it can be argued, in fact, uh, under circumstances that it's not right because the risks of failure once you begin to impound tailings are very substantial. Nevertheless, that was in the guideline and everything that was proceeding here was not violated by the requirements of design. Uh, what happened is uh, the, this material at this particular location, uh, there was inadequate site, there was barely any site investigation to identify that where the failure occurred, this glacial lake clay deposit existed. Secondly, it neglected to understand that even had they located it, that as you continue to build on top of it, its characteristics would change. It has an overconsolidation ratio in its, call it natural state here, of perhaps four or five. But as you begin to build on top of it, the overconsolidation ratio reduces to unity and it becomes normally consolidated. So in fact, one has ended up inadvertently building this structure on a normally consolidated clay. And the material has a slight sensitivity, so it's slightly strain weakening. Our analysis showed that uh, the rate of construction was relatively slow, so there weren't any significant pore pressures in any of this material. Uh, this steep slope was accepted. It wasn't violating its design factor safety, but it is steep. It's the kind of rock fill slope that you'd usually build on a strong foundation. The till isn't bad, but that's fairly provocative in design. But ultimately, this is normally consolidated with some strain weakening. There were people on the dam, uh, perhaps about a half hour before it failed. Uh, this was night, and they were doing some work on a pump or something like that. We know when it failed because of a knockout of, of uh, electrical uh, capacity. So it failed very suddenly, and it failed and moved significantly in an undrained manner. So it actually failed undrained, having got to the yield point drained. With the stress, over, with the reduction of overconsolidation ratio due to the building of the facility. We also had, because of operational issues, a fair amount of water in the structure and a lot of the, a lot of loss of tailing, the loss of the embankment. You saw it, a lot of it didn't flow away as an embankment. It was washed away because of the amount of water that was in storage. So this is um, the Mount Polly in short. The commentary that we have is the root cause of the breach was the undrained failure of the upper glacial lake unit on the imposed load of this perimeter embankment, lower than the, the main one. The design did not take into account the complexity of the subglacial and preglacial geological environment associated with the perimeter embankment foundation. The emissions associated with site characterization may be likened to creating a loaded gun. 
if constructing unknowingly on the upper GLU constituted loading the gun, building with a 1.3 to 1 vertical angle of repose slope over the stratum pulled the trigger. So that is, in a nutshell, one of the uh, occurrences in our profession uh, under the aegis of experienced, well-known consultants in a regulatory environment that is um, one of the uh, certainly adept in dealing with, a, with the mining industry and so on. The report goes into other aspects and so on, but this is part of the issues that haunt us as we speak. Let me go on to the second case that haunts us, and this is the other forensic investigation that, that I chaired over the last couple of years, I guess now. And this is the Fundal Dam in, in uh, Brazil, but failed um, uh, just a little over two years ago, I guess, and killed 19 people. Uh, the tailings, uh, let me just tell you what you're looking at. This is, oh, sorry. Oh, where did I go? <laughs> go back. Thank you. Thank you. So what you're looking at is a Fundal Dam. This is for an iron ore mine. It's about 100 meters high here. You can see other dams in the vicinity. And the dam is intended to store coarse sand coming as tailings separated from the fines, which are called slimes, behind it. That's, so that's, it's, it's, and it's an upstream construction, uh, but it was intended to have a unsaturated buttress to provide resistance. You can see some odd shaping here. There's a plateau here, and the uh, crest of the dam has moved back. The starter dam leaked during construction. They had to change the design, which I'll speak to a little bit uh, about in a moment. And there are also uh, dewatering galleries underneath that were going to be overstressed if they weren't repaired or plugged off. And in order to continue building the dam, uh, one had to build uh, a setback in order to stop overloading these galleries underneath the dam. In addition, during operations, the tailings, the fine tailings, uh, were allowed for operational reasons to encroach into this region, uh, which uh, was not contrary, contrary to the design concept. Uh, this is the case after failure. You can see that the dam has flowed out. The other structures are still here. The dam is gone. The dam uh, killed 19, the flow out killed 19 people destroyed several villages. Uh, the mobility of the tailings got down to the sea where it affected uh, fishing in the ocean. And there is uh, uh, major hundreds of millions of dollars of reconstruction underway as we speak. Um, and uh, the total cost of, uh, of restoration of the communities and so on is at the moment in negotiation by the uh, mining companies and the government, but it's going to be measured in several billions of US dollars. The company was called Samarco, but it was a joint, a joint venture of BHP, the largest mining company in the world, and Vale, uh, the uh, uh, largest mining company in Brazil. There were uh, well-known designers, the review board, and other things involved, and yet this occurred. Um, so this also haunts us a little bit. Again, you'll find on the, on the web a complete description of our final report. If you just look up Fundal Dam, uh, failure report or something, you'll find our report with all the appendices and calculations that we did. You'll also find a presentation, uh, too long for me to repeat here, uh, that was the press briefing, but there is an animation 
of the final mechanism that created the collapse because it failed due to static liquefaction. And I, the, the animation is a little large, so I've just got a portion of it uh, to, uh, to show you. Um, <laughs> I seem to just forget which bit of this works. I want to get to that. Spare No, I won't. Sorry, the next. This one. This one? Yeah. This squeezing is referred to as lateral extrusion. So these are the the movement of the slimes forward was unobservable to the naked eye. The sands in the dam were also relatively loose, uncompacted, and saturated. Sands under these conditions are susceptible to liquefaction. Liquefaction occurs when the strength of sands is so low that they can readily flow, or, in other words, behave as a liquid. The sands also had contractive properties, meaning that when they were saturated and placed under stress, such as additional weight, or stress was removed, such as when the slimes underneath the sands moved, the sands would tend to take up less space and could abruptly collapse. This video was taken from lab tests of the sands used to build Fundau that were done by the experts. The container is filled with saturated sands from Fundau. The yellow circle with the black ring is slowly removing the stress from the sands, the same way that stress was removed from the sands at Fundau as the slimes underneath were squeezed forward. Watch carefully. Notice that abruptly and without any observable indicators, the sands collapse. All of these conditions, that is, the presence of soft slimes underneath the setback alignment and the loose, uncompacted and saturated sands, initiated a mechanism of extrusion of the slimes and a pulling apart of the sands as the embankment height increased. As the slimes were being squeezed forward, the sands above moved with them, trying to mimic their movement. But the sands, unlike the slimes, are not cohesive. As a result, the sands, which were saturated, lost cohesiveness and collapsed, which resulted in the flow slide. For those of you who have never seen a flow slide, this is a, a kind of a sentinel camera in the impoundment after the failures occurred. But you're looking at some tailings. And is this on now? It's, it's on? Uh, and you're looking at some tailings. And um, uh, interesting to see you can see some material flowing in on the right-hand side. It's still the rainy season. So material is being turned, fluidized. And then keep your eye on the forefront of this material to understand what the flow slide means when the tailings liquefy. I actually interviewed somebody who got trapped in these flowing tailings and survived. It was quite a harrowing experience. Watch the forefront. The failure of the Fondal Taylor's Dam by liquefaction flow sliding was a consequence of a chain of events and conditions. Change in design brought about an increase in saturation, which introduced the potential for liquefaction. As a result of various developments, soft slimes encroached into unintended areas on the left abutment of the dam, and the embankment alignment was set back from its originally planned location. As a result of this setback, slimes existed beneath the embankment and were subjected to the loading its raising imposed. This initiated a mechanism of extrusion of the slimes and pulling apart of the sands as the embankment height increased. With only a small additional increment of loading produced by some small earthquakes, the triggering of liquefaction was accelerated and the flow slide initiated. So let me conclude 
What I've tried to do is draw on my experience in recent years to highlight evolving trends in geotechnical practice that provide examples of challenges and positive direction for our way forward. So under analysis and design, I think we're going to see the increased adoption of performance-based design as more powerful numerical simulation integrated with all potential failure modes of important geotechnical structures uh, are employed in an increasingly realistic manner. In terms of mobility and risk, the increased adoption of QRA methodologies to strengthen risk-informed decision-making both in private organizations and in public policy uh, is something to look forward to, at least for communities of sufficient technological maturity. And in terms of professional practice, I think we'll see the increased penetration of probabilistic-based design for slopes and dams, at least in parallel with more traditional procedures. That's the good news. However, this lecture does not end on a positive note, as it draws attention to the inadequacies in practice of dealing with model and human uncertainty. Gaps in knowledge and incorrect interpretation of failure mechanisms with dire consequences are too frequent, and public trust in the geotechnical community will remain weakened until these conditions are not only remedied, but also are seen to have been remedied. I get some comfort from the success here in Hong Kong in moving toward zero risk related to landslide hazards, which provides an example to our communities of what can be achieved and hopefully emulated in the future. I want to acknowledge the many people who contributed to this presentation, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Morganstone, for this comprehensive presentation. And please stay. Uh, now we'll proceed to the Q&A section. So if you have any question, please raise your hand. Oh, gentleman over there, please pass the mic to him. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Morganstone. So uh, actually, I would like to know, ask a question on the dry granular flow, uh, dry granular material the liquefaction. So uh, I study your paper. So in your paper, so the liquefaction happens on when the horizontal acceleration exceeds a, a level, and the laboratory observation is the reduce of the shear strength and the vertical displacement. So my question is, if we take a little bit into the uh, micro property of the particles, for example, the green contact, so how can we uh, identify this kind of fluidization mechanism? Should we use the uh, contact, the reduce of the contact force, or the, should we calculate the inertial numbers? Oh. I don't know the answer. I just know it's a difficult problem. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that there's, first of all, I think we should begin to look at some field evidence because many of these, these are all large slides. The larger the slide, the lower the resistance, as you know. And there's now quite a lot of information about the seismic generation of information coming out of that. So I think any uh, in mechanistic inspection should try to match some of that boundary effects as giving some confinement, uh, intellectual confinement, on trying, trying to answer that. So I, I, I think my, my major intent to, to, uh, to introduce that into this discussion is to caution against oversimplification. <laughs> I think you know that. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Thank you so much. Thank you for your question. So are there any questions on the floor? Uh, if no, then we may uh, end the lecture now. And thank you again for Mr. Uh, Professor Morganston for your sharing and all of your attendance. And please remind her to uh, sign on your attendance certificate and stem on the stem on it. Allow our staff to stem on it in the counter. So thank you and see you.